Hello everybody, uh, my name is Julian Fischer, I'm CEO of any 9s uh, and I'm running Cloud Foundries for a living. So welcome to this talk about building a production-grade Postgres Cloud Foundry service. So first of all, the question is, what does production-grade mean? Um, from my experience um, talking to various Cloud Foundry customers, the meaning of uh, production readiness is uh, defined fairly different in different contexts. But also, we've experienced that a production readiness litmus test is running a public Cloud Foundry. Why is that? It is because you're onboarding users you don't know. So there's no relation of trust between you as the platform provider as well as your customers. You might be onboarding people with poorly designed apps. You might be onboarding people with unpredictable traffic peaks and also you might onboard vicious users with uh, a vicious behavior. So how do we actually design something that withstands uh, those production requirements? Um, we have to go through and answer some of the basic design des decisions. Um, one of which, when implementing a service, um, a Cloud Foundry service, is you have to implement the Service Broker API uh, in order to integrate your service into the, the, the Cloud Foundry marketplace. Um, and by, when implementing such a service, the central question is how you define what a service instance is going to be. So for Postgres database, there are several possibilities, uh, and we will have a short glance at what the options are and what are the decisions to be made. First of all, coming from an operations background uh, and operating databases for quite a while, one of the decisions you have to make is whether you want to run a, uh, a single database or a database cluster with several databases uh, being somehow connected. So this decision, um, well, could be argued towards having a single server because there's, uh, in case you deploy your solution with, uh, with Bosch, you could actually say, well, there's a resurrection. And whenever your database goes down, uh, Bosch will recreate the virtual machine, reattach attach your persistent disk, and you'll be fine. However, this scenario will take a few minutes to, uh, to, to repair, and maybe a few minutes are unacceptable in your definition of production readiness. So when clustering Postgres, the next uh, topic you'll be looking at is replication. With replication in general, you have to make a decision between uh, using synchronous and asynchronous uh, replication. As we've seen, uh, MySQL Galera, MariaDB Galera, with uh, being a very nice uh, synchronous solution for relational databases, we thought it would be a good idea to go with uh, Postgres, Postgres internal replication, which is a asynchronous replication. However, this replica replication comes with some limitations, uh, which are about the, there's a lack of failure detection and automatic failover capabilities. Nothing like that is built into Postgres. So you'll have to take care of yourself on how to detect a failed master um, how to decide when and which uh, node has failed. So how do you build a quorum? How do you perform a failover once you actually uh, identify the failure situation? And how to ensure that app will write to the correct master? So with all these questions, uh, Postgres replication uh, won't give you an, a an answer. So we've been looking for a cluster manager that um, will actually take care of failure detection and, and performing failovers. Historically, we've been using Pacemaker for a while, but uh, it turned out that Pacemaker is, uh, is not designed to run on, uh, on an infrastructure uh, and within you know, a cloud environment such as Cloud Foundry. So after investigating a few possible solutions, we, uh, we, actually, we actually found the Rep Manager, uh, which is a replication manager for Postgres. It's an open source project. 
and it allows you to monitor all the replication performance. It does pickle detection and also helps you um, doing leader election and promoting masters. So that's exactly what we've been looking for. So in the end, we are able to create a Postgres cluster um, using the Rep Manager, um, which is also important that it's also important to mention that the Rep Manager was particularly well, uh, particularly suitable in order to automate all these these tasks. So Pacemaker, for example, you know, actually does all the the, the, the things we actually needed to do but it was a struggle to automate it uh, for, for several reasons. First of all, the way you configure Pacemaker is not really automation friendly and also it has a hell lot of dependencies eating a lot of time, you know, boshifying this, this beast. Um, with Rep Manager, one thing you can do is provide a promote script that will be triggered when a master, a new master database is promoted. So we actually, uh, every, every database virtual machine we deploy there's a rep manager uh, instance running, and whenever a ma new master is promoted because the, the actual master has failed, uh, the Bosch, uh, the promote script uh, will be triggered by the rep manager. And this promote script does things like uh, updating DNS entries of our console cluster, which is used to ensure that all applications are writing to only the master server and, um, and exclusively to the master server. All right, so once you, be, you are able to deploy a cluster over a single server, you might feel, well, that's good enough. But in the end, there's another decision to be made, which is, is it really good enough to have one cluster for your entire Cloud Foundry, or do you want to have dedicated Postgres uh, virtual machines? So looking at the shared uh, scenario, with the shared strategy, uh, with, you'll actually deploy a, a single virtual, po virtual machine representing a Postgres server or, or at least a Postgres cluster where you actually use Postgres internal uh, multi-tenancy capabilities to separate service instances. So in this scenario, your post service instance is going to be represented by a database within a single Postgres server or cluster. Obviously, this has some limitations because the tenant isolation of a database is not 100% uh, strong. For example, you might run into disk I/O or CPU utilization issues, uh, so that one database uh, application, uh, application A accessing database A might drag down the performance of the entire Postgres cluster. Also, another problem with that approach is that a shared Postgres database is a single point of failure. So looking at a scenario where a runtime, a fairly big runtime, actually runs a large number of applications, all applications uh, using a Postgres will use one single shared cluster. So you'll have to scale the, the, the hell vertically out of this cluster to really make this platform work. From our experience, it will not work. So at one time, at one point in time, your cluster will fail. It might fail because there's too many, too many databases on it, or it might fail just because you know something happens on the infrastructure level taking down your cluster. However, if that scenario happens, Imagine a large number of application goes down, uh, go down, and with such an impact, be sure you'll have a hell of a time because your customers will be very, very angry. So your shared Postgres cluster goes down, all your Postgres database instances go down, which is not a funny thing. So the counter strategy to uh, go with the shared cluster would be to have dedicated service instances represented by dedicated virtual machines. So instead of a single virtual machine or a single cluster, you can have either or both of it as many times as you want to have service instances. So with that particular approach, you have the benefit that the infrastructure isolation 
will also enable you uh, or give you the multi-tenancy support you actually want to have. So the customer always know what he gets. You give him a virtual machine with a certain amount of CPU, with a certain amount of RAM, and a certain amount of, um, of disk space, that's what he's going to use. Whenever his application, you know, um, whenever his application uses more resources than offered by uh, your virtual machine, um, well, that's actually up to him. So looking at the scenario again, your runtime is full of apps, and you know now the ratio between apps and databases is uh, much more reasonable. So now, if one instance goes down, for what reason ever, maybe there's an infrastructure outage, or the application is just you know poorly designed, the impact on your runtime is um, is fairly different. So in that scenario that uh, you know where the ratio between applications and um, per database cluster is very different, your failures, uh, your Postgres fails are contained, and only those only one service instance is affected, uh, including apps pointing to that or bound to that service instance. All right. Now we've been through the, deci the, the decision or the question whether to have a cluster or a server, preferably a cluster, and whether to do this shared or dedicated, preferably, preferably using a dedicated approach. The question rises on how and when do we actually provision those virtual machines or clusters? So two strategies come to mind. Um, first, you can actually have the virtual machines being pre-provisioned, where a service broker acts as a pool of virtual machines. Uh, each deployment, uh, well, let's say a number of instances being ready for each service plan to be offered. And whenever you run a CF create, you assign one of the virtual machines out of the pool or virtual machines or cluster out of the pool and deliver the service instance accordingly. In contrast to that, the on-demand provision strategy won't have any pre-provisioned virtual machines but use some automation technology uh, in order to create those virtual machines on demand. So this approach obviously comes with the advantage of the advantage that you don't use infrastructure resources, um, basically virtual, running virtual machines, where where no service instance is currently allocated, with the drawback that it will take some time to provision those virtual machines. So as fast service instance provisioning is a requirement, the pre-provision strategy is an advantage. In any other case, I'm pretty sure that the on-demand strategy is what you actually want to have. All right, so ideally you want an on-demand provision dedicated data service cluster or Postgres clusters in our case. So you need, you need a strong automation technology that helps you doing exactly that. And for us, this means well, we've been we fell in deeply in love with Bosch. We've uh, we have plenty of experience in in using Bosch, deploying our cloud foundry. So we thought that compared to all the other technologies out there, Bosch has a great um, Bosch has a great unique feature set. So we decided to give it a try for data services as well. One of the great features of Bosch, I don't have to tell you, is there is its infrastructure independence. So N9 has moved two times uh, from one infrastructure to the other. So we started on VMware, then moved to OpenStack for cost reasons, and then moved to AWS for stability reasons. This wouldn't have been possible uh, without, without Bosch's infrastructure independence. 
also there's barely a solution out there that really integrates you know a variety of of and, and it's very a, a comprehensive variety of of features including a uh, a comprehensive virtual machine and persistent disk management. Also, one of the features that are very interesting in Bosch is a real operating system independence. So as long as you build your packages within your Bosch releases uh, from source, you will have a homogeneous structure uh, across all operating systems. So it's very easy to switch from one operating system to the other which we've learned is very important because everything we've built can be used, let's say, on-site at a customer uh, who, for reasons of their internal policies, uh, requires uh, running on a different database, uh, on a different operating system. Also, Bosch comes with the great advantage of um, having a clear separation between the blueprint and the construction of a distributed system. So, in a Bosch release, you describe the abstract distributed system and in the Bosch deployment and in, future, in, in recent versions in addition to the cloud config you'll actually specify how this deployment really looks like in terms of what virtual machines to use and what size and what memory and what disk and whatever. This is very important for building a production grade Postgres because you have one Bosch release and you can serve several service plans out of that single Postgres uh, Bosch release, for example, having a single virtual machine versus a Postgres cluster um, service plan. Bosch also helps a lot when it comes to monitoring and self-healing, so you get an entire set of feature functionality basically for free. One of which is whenever you run a virtual uh, or a cluster with uh, with Bosch. So, in our case, every service instance is a Bosch deployment. Whenever a virtual machine fails, not only the rep manager will choose a new master and uh, keep your Postgres running. No, furthermore, Bosch will actually recognize that there's a missing virtual machine and will re recreate this virtual machine for you by using the Bosch resurrection functionality. All right. So with this already, uh, with this being said, there's an, another great facility, great functionality coming for free with um, with Bosch, which is when every service instance you have is represented by a Bosch deployment, you can actually change that deployment and use Bosch uh, lifecycle management facilities uh, and functionalities to also scale your service instances. So let's say. Like in this example, where you have on the left side a Postgres, a single Postgres instance, and you want to, and you want to scale out this Postgres instance to become a large cluster, all you have to do is issue a service update command, and by creating a different a Bosch deployment manifest, you can actually run a new deployment and turn your one server into a large cluster. Of course, you can do the same with a, uh, with a small cluster and turning it into a large cluster. So how does the solution for Postgres, uh, how does the overall uh, service design then look like? So let's have a look at the components we've created to, uh, to do that. So as you can see, we've obviously had to implement a service broker. One of the design goals we had was to um, have a service broker that's being uh, reusable. So the N9 service broker is generic. It implements the CF broker, uh, the Cloud Foundry service broker API, but it is not specific to Postgres. All specific Postgres specific uh, functionality has been outsourced to a dedicated component uh, called the SPI, the Service Provider Interface, in this case the Postgres SPI. So the Postgres SPI encapsulates all the Postgres specific logic. For example, this means or this includes um, the service catalog metadata, 
the Postgres, uh, uh, the, the management of instance credentials. So whenever you create a Postgres database, you have to generate some admin credentials. Whenever you create service binding, you have to create a database user. And all this functionality is then being encapsulated in the service broker, uh, in the service broker's SPI. So whenever you start a service broker, you'll just configure him to use a certain SPI and you're good to go. So one other component that's central uh, for this solution is the N9's deployer, whose major responsibility is to manage Bosch deployments. So let's have a look at how those components actually interact to see uh, the or how the orchestration works. So whenever a cloud, whenever a service instance is to be created, your request will re will hit against or will be hit against the cloud controller, and the cloud control controller then talks to the any nine service broker, who will subsequently call the Postgres S SPI in order to prepare a deployment. Preparing a deployment means that you'll have to figure out uh, a number of attributes that will later be fed into a Bosch deployment manifest template. So this is being delivered from the Postgres-specific SPI as there are Postgres-specific attributes in there. And with these attributes, you can actually choose a certain template, a template that's been chosen by the service plan, for example, the single uh, Postgres database service plan, and along with those attributes, the N9's deployer will then generate a deployment manifest and run uh, and execute this deployment. So the cloud controller then will actually keep on calling uh, about the status of, of the deployment, which will then obviously take a while until the virtual machines are created, the packages are, uh, are, are compiled and, and, and installed. So in the end, when the deployment has finished. The N9's deployer will um, update the service broker, who will then store some metadata about that the fact that there's another service instance, which is essential to know of whenever there's a, certain, a service binding to be created. The service broker has to know where uh, which um, deployments are actually out there. So yeah, the service broker will actually update the state and uh, tell the, the cloud controller that the service instance creation has been completed successfully. And this whole system works like charm, and there's plenty we learned of that, uh, of, of doing that. But a few things need to be shared and can be mentioned here. First of which, dedicated service instances are absolutely mandatory. We started with, uh, with a shared approach, and our customers, they actually destroyed the shared cluster uh, in a very short amount of time. So with, with heavy service impact, we decided to move away from shared services for several reasons, one of which is that shared clusters always break. And secondly, not every service, for example, Redis, has a built-in multi-tenancy capability. So there's no way around offering a strategy for dedicated services in general. So the on-demand provisioning is also essential because otherwise, without that, you won't be able to uh, keep on adding new service instances uh, as you'll never know when uh, customers will create service instances. For example, um, there's a hackathon somewhere, uh, might be a large group of people uh, creating service instances in a very short amount of time. And also, picking Bosch as a as, as the automation technology against established technologies such as Chef, uh, which we've been using for more than seven years, um, was, the, was a wise choice because the particular feature set of Bosch has been developed in the context of Cloud Foundry and deploying a complex um, distributed system such as Cloud Foundry is not an easy task. And although the dedicated service scenario is a little different, uh, Bosch turned out to be the right choice. So I can actually tell that the greatest challenge we've been facing with Postgres was uh, building Postgres was not about Bosch, but it was about finding a Postgres replication and clustering tool so that allows 
automation and then iteratively learn how to configure and automate common uh, and edge case scenarios. So we had an ops team and we had a development team. The development team had to learn about Postgres a lot and uh, we are still learning a lot uh, about the, the, you know, the large number of different use cases our customers have in their data centers. All right, so that's about that's about it. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions? Feel free to ask.